And today we've picked an area of focus. Um, so we've got the guys from the customer experience team to talk to you today. And I always say life is a journey and in your organisations you go through many journeys with all your partners, clients, donors and those that you support in the community. So it's really important to enhance those experiences and to utilise them so that you can share what you do in the community um, and share the impact. We also have um, Joanne coming to talk to you about the uh, Treasurer's Award that CBA have. Um, so she come up and have a chat and we've also got Darren to talk to you about measuring impact. And then we'll have Eloise to do um, a bit of an update on an opportunity that we have in our innovation space. So I might welcome uh, Julianne to come up and chat to you. I'd just like to echo that uh, welcome, welcome to CBA um, and thank you also to Kim and her team at HR Manager. You always, uh, yourself and Yvette always do a great job with these events, um, which obviously uh, is meant to a number of people in this room today, so well done. Um, I won't take too much of your time, I really um, wanted to just make sure you're aware of the CBA Treasurer's Awards, you'll see a little flyer um, in front of you. Uh, if you're not a treasurer, please um, nominate your treasurer for recognition. I had a number of board members uh, contact me last year when um, you know they acknowledged their uh, local treasurers or their voluntary treasurers at board meetings. And you can just imagine these treasurers who really are often the unsung heroes of, of an organisation to keep the finances going, um, and they, they're usually working long hours late at night doing multiple jobs. So. Um, this is a way to say thank you for their efforts. And if you are a treasurer, um, there is a section, a separate section to this um, awards program where you can share your insights um, for the chance to win $5,000 uh, towards your organisation. So please um, take the opportunity um, to nominate your treasurer. And if you do have a little bit of spare capacity, I don't know how these local treasurers find it, but they do, um, please share your insights for a chance to win $5,000. Last year we had close to 2,000 nominations, um, so you know, please um, feel free to, to uh, recognise those unsung heroes within your organisation. So thank you for your attention, and I think I'll now hand over to Kim. Thanks, Kim. Okay, hello everyone, and let me set the scene for you. Specific moments in our lives are often fleeting and difficult to recall. As designers, one of the major challenges of creating digital products is how to make them memorable so that users keep wanting to use them. And that is what you're going to see today. This session is how to create moments that matter, the art of crafting unforgettable experiences so we'll explore what factors contribute to memorial, sort of memorial, I'm so sorry, memorable design experiences. <laughs> what are some bad, bad designs, there's the memorial. <laughs> what are some bad design pitfalls to avoid and the power of moments, framing for designing great experiences. So I'd like to welcome Chris Wood, Senior Manager and Digital Lead, and Sean Norrie, Senior Service and Experience Designer at C Experience. Thank you so much. Can everyone hear me with the lapel? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for inviting us to speak today. Uh, Chris and I come from a company called the Customer Experience Company, and luckily our name pretty much says what we do. Um, so we're based out in the Rock. Uh, so we're actually based out in, in between the rocks and Circular King, um, and we've been around for about we've been around for about 15 years, um, and we're a specialist CX agency. So we work uh, in management consulting, but we also do a lot of work around customer measurements specifically, 
Um, and just to caveat, when I talk about customers today, I'm talking about anyone who consumes your services. So not just the people that necessarily pay, but anyone who is interacting with any service that you're providing. Um, and, and this is our office. It's a lovely space with lots of whiteboards, as you can imagine, um, and it's completely movable. So what we try to do is we try to approach any problem that we have uh, using human-centered design for design thinking. So just a quick show of hands. Has anyone in here today had any experience with human-centered design? Try design thinking, anything like that. Okay. So I'll just get a bit of this. Um, so effectively, what it is is it's saying instead of looking at problems as a business problem, let's look at them as a human problem. Let's look at problems as humans understand them, as humans behave, um, because we know that humans are irrational. So what we'll do is we'll always go to qualitative research with customers. We try to do quantitative research as well, but we try to understand their needs and behaviours. And once we can understand those, then we can start to design services. Um, for what customers value, but not, not based on assumption, but based on actually talking to them. Uh, so today's session is going to be in kind of two parts. So the first one is how to create moments that matter, and the second one is about using it in your day to day. Um, and it's all based on a book, so any of you can go and read this book. And the book is a book by two brothers called Jim and Dan Heap. And they have a few books which are amazing. They're, they're a great resource that we use at CEC to kind of train ourselves. And uh, this book specifically is about the power of money. And what they come at it, and it's actually quite a nice message that they have, because it's not doing and gloom, it's actually quite inspirational. And they say that you know, our lives are measured in moments, and defining moments are the ones that endure in our memories. And that most experiences are forgettable, but occasionally remarkable. And what they're trying to say through, through this book is how can you create experiences that aren't just uh, mediocre, but how do you create amazing experiences? How do you let, create something that goes from good to great? So a lot of the stories, I'm going to tell a lot of stories, Chris will also tell a few stories from our experience in the full purpose organization space, um, will be about how we, or how these two brothers managed to raise experiences from being something that was quite mediocre to something that was really amazing. So we'll start with a bit of theory. I don't know if anyone has ever heard of peak end theory or peak end rule. It's a behavioral theory that says that humans only remember the best or the worst part of an experience and the end. So if you look back on maybe a holiday that you've taken or an experience that you've had in your past, generally the only things that will stick out to you is the end and maybe the, the best is most important. Um, and what's interesting is that our memory of events is shaped by just the highest and lowest moments. So it's a lot of those in-betweens get forgotten, and a lot of those in-betweens make up the vast majority of the service that you're delivering. So what this, what this book tries to say is, how do you recover from the natural pits in experiences? And I'll get into that in a little bit more detail in a moment. And how do you raise natural peaks? So there's going to be moments in the experiences of the services that you're delivering that naturally afford more positive experiences. And how do you really raise those up by applying four key principles, which I'll talk to you about today. Um, and, and yeah, so when people assess experiences, as I've said, they tend to um, have this phenomenon, ph ph phenomenon occur called duration neglect, which is you forget the duration of an experience and you only really remember those positive, those really positive, really negative experiences at the end. So as I said, I'm going to tell you a lot of stories. So I'm not sure if any of you can tell what you're actually looking at over there, but that's a children's MRI machine. And I'm not sure if any of you have heard this story, but um, Doug Dietz was an industrial designer and he was working for General Electric and yeah, he gave him a brief one day that said, I want you to redesign an MRI machine. So Doug went out and spent about two years engaging uh, you know, doctors, mechanics, scientists, engineers, other industrial designers, and he made the most ergonomic, the most you know, scientifically accurate MRI machine that he could possibly make. And he records this, and there's actually a TED talk on this, so I highly recommend if you have a chance, go and watch this TED talk. Um, and he records his experience about the first day that he went to go see this MRI machine in action. And he says that he was standing in the room looking at this MRI machine like it was his baby, he was so proud of it. And he heard that one of the first patients was coming in, so he went outside, and down the corridor he saw a, a, a young girl walking with her two parents. And as they got she was really nervous because she hadn't had been through an MRI scan before. And her father bent down to her and said, we've discussed this, you can be brave. And he followed her into the room and he, as he reports it, he said he saw the room for the first time 
like this young girl saw it. There was black and yellow <coughs> tape on the floor. There was radiation signs, there was exclamation marks, there was beeping <coughs> buzzers and all these sorts of things. And he said, I've just designed a really good MRI machine, but I haven't designed an experience that a child can actually engage with, that a child wants to engage with. Um, and what's interesting about this is that at, at this point in time, a lot of children actually had to be sedated to go through MRI scans. So what did he do? He went and he got funding, and he went back and he engaged teachers, parents, uh, children, storytellers, uh, clowns. He engaged a number of different people who weren't scientists, who weren't doctors, who weren't down in the detail of how an MRI machine worked. And he created experiences. So now, when a child goes and gets an MRI scan, they go in the day before, they take their favorite teddy bear, they have a mini MRI machine, and they put their teddy bear through that mini MRI machine so that they can understand what the process is going to be like. They start telling a story about a mermaid or a pirate or um, you know, a captain of a ship, and they have all of these little narratives that they start to create with children. And then when they come in the next day, the nurses have their face painted, they're all dressed up as the narrative can say, and a child goes through this journey. And that's why this looks like an underwater web. And what he did is he realized that there's going to be natural peaks and there's going to be natural fits in the experience. An MRI machine, you're going to have to go in an MRI machine. You have to live it. You have to have the da 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 That has to happen. He couldn't change that. But he could change what envelops that experience. And that's really um, the moral of, of the story. Is how, how can you understand that there's going to be natural peaks and fits in the experience of the services that you're delivering? And how can you identify them? And then how can you redesign them or try to reshape them so that they can take something from being good to being great. Um, and he recalls, and he almost has tears in his eyes as he recalls the story, he says that when, when this was first trialed, a child turned to their parent afterwards and said, hey mum, can we come back tomorrow? <coughs> and it's, it's an amazing story about how you can just reframe an experience that, that, that really is, is quite traumatic for anyone to talk to. So what's the more moral of the story is that peak moments matter. Um, really happy customers uh, really should matter to you. Um, but what's interesting is that we're actually, as humans, we're not really very good at building peaks. We're really, really good at fixing problems and identifying pits and experiences. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that. Um, I think we're just generally trained to do that. Um, but there's, there's something I'm going to put to you now. So imagine that this is your organization. Um, and down here you have a bunch of unhappy customers, and up here you have a bunch of happy customers. So it's a scale of one to seven. Um, so I might get you to vote. Put your left hand up for plan A, if you would magically eliminate all your unhappy customers, the ones, twos, and threes, and bring them up to a four. And your right hand, if you would instantly vault all your neutrals up to a seven. Vote now. Left or right? I'm going to get you to use your hands a lot today. So if you're drinking. Um, so, interestingly, and I can't, I can't see from here, I'll have to turn around and, and look backwards, um, is that the, the value of the customer who is happy is nine times as much as the value of the customer who is unhappy. Um, so I'm not sure if any of you are doing any customer measurement right now, have any experience with NPS, any hands up again, anyone doing it? Yeah? Um, I'm sure you know, as, as many people say, that promoters Promoters are much more value to you than neutrals as attractors. Um, nine times as much as the study in the book showed. And it was an airline, to be fair, but these customers are nine times as valuable. Um, but what's even more interesting is that by every hour that we spend on unhappy customers, they spend 15 minutes on happy customers. There's a huge amount of effort that's placed on trying to make or fix pits in the experience rather than trying to create really amazing experiences. And it's a natural occurrence because, you know, when someone comes to you and says that something's broken, you feel like you have to fix that. But it's what I'm trying to say today is it's really worth time, trying to, it's, it's really worth your time trying to find an opportunity to get some people in your team or even yourselves to focus on a couple of moments in your experience. Um, and that might come through the customer measurement that you're doing, if any of you are doing that, and finding ways to raise that to be really, really amazing experience. Um, and there's four ways to do that. Um, which, which, which I'll touch on. So um, I'm just going to caveat that by saying that every great service company is great for service recovery. Oh, sorry. Yeah. And for those who don't know what service recovery is, it's a company's ability to rebound from service failure. 
So things are natural, as I said, things are naturally going to go wrong in an experience. But it, the, the ability of an organization to rebound from that has a huge impact on the way that customers perceive you. Um, and I'm sure many of you would have had the experience where something might have gone wrong with you know, an internet bill payment or something like that. And you might have had an experience where a company went above and beyond and did something that you never expected them to do. And as a result, you told all your friends and all your family you had a really fond memory of that experience. So if you look here, if you look at this customer loyalty graph, uh, over here you have a, an instance of service failure. Uh, if, if you do service recovery well, what's quite interesting is that customers become more loyal to you in the long term than they would if they didn't have that failure. Um, so I'm not saying go out and make, make breakpoints and then get really good, um, uh, have, have, have really good service recovery, but I'm saying there's naturally going to be times when you might have to hand over uh, your customer to a third party service provider, for example, or you're handing it over to somebody else to do a test or to do something that's outside of your control. And, and it's really important to understand what those are. And once you can understand what those are, you can put the proper controls in place to make sure that you can design um, a, a recovery experience that can create really, really um, fond or, 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 or positive experiences. And just on that point, um, you can see examples of this with some best of breed organizations around the world as well. So companies that are really, really good at this have thought this through, as Sean said. They've identified those areas and the things that they can't mitigate. They've actually got experience, processes, outcomes, teams dedicated to actually trying to solve that. And that's there's a whole range of different examples, whether you're looking at airlines or manufacturing or distribution. Um, you know, even Netflix is a great example for me. Um, so Netflix you know, represents um, has a monthly subscription model. They understand that as a consumer, there's going to be a number of people who are going to want to cancel their plan in the middle of a month. Um, and they do that. So unlike, say, the telco industry that, that suffers with this issue of pro rata in people's bills and crediting and debiting and doing all this stuff, uh, what do Netflix do? Well, Netflix just wipe that away. They just take a hit on that and say, well, you've cancelled it two-thirds of the way through a $10 plan per month. We're just going to waive the $3. Oh, that's a great outcome. So that's a cost to them, that's a cost to their bottom line to do that. But they've recognised this is going to occur. But when I'm a consumer and I get that on my bill, I suddenly realise, oh, actually that wasn't that painless after all, was it? That's actually a pretty good thing. And in fact, I stand up here and tell you about that as a story because I'm one of the $9, not the $1. Mm. So it's a pretty good example where you can see organisations that are aware of these touch points and aware of these, these dips in the experience. And once you know about it, then there's a whole range of different things that you can potentially do to mitigate it if you can't get rid of it, if you can't stop it from happening in the first place. Yeah, and, and just on that, I'm sure many of you would have taken an Uber trip before. If you've ever had to um, cancel an Uber trip five or ten minutes after you've ordered the Uber, you'll, then, you'll know that you can then go back in the app and you can say that you had to cancel because the driver took the wrong exit or something like that. They automatically credit you that $10 back. That's them conducting a service recovery and they automatically do that because for them, the amount of effort it takes to query whether or not you're making a false claim isn't even worth it. And I'm standing up here telling you that story right now. So for them, it's really, really powerful. So special moments can be created by considering the following four principles. And we'll go through them in, in quite a bit of detail. Um, elevation, insight, pride, and connection. So let's start with elevation. So moments of elevation are defining moments. They rise above the everyday routine, and they provoke not just transient happiness, like laughing at a friend's joke, but memorable delight, things that you will go and you will tell your friends and your family about and that you will remember for time to come. And there's three ways to do that. Uh, by boosting sensory appeal, by raising the stakes, and by breaking the script. And I'll go through um, a few stories to, to articulate what those mean. So boosting sensory appeal. Uh, this, is, this is the first of many stories, again, that I'm, that I'm gonna tell. Uh, so, in America, I'm not sure if any of you know what college signing day is. It's the day when high school students sign on to colleges to, to play American football. And it's a huge day. ESPN um, hosts it. It's sponsored. For many of these high school students, it means uh, the start of a really, really long and profitable career. And it's watched by millions and millions of Americans. Uh, and these two teachers were teaching at a, school, a, a low socioeconomic school in the States, and they said, you know, for some of the kids who are going to get admitted into college from our high school, it's as big of a day as these kids who are going to go play American football because they're the first people ever, ever in their family to go to college. 
So I said, well, how can we make this day bigger and better and more important for these kids than getting posts in the mail and opening it privately in their room and then having that, that moment just to themselves? So they, they got the school band, they got the cheerleading squad, they got their friends, the family, they got um, the principal, the mayor, they got everyone out. And they have this day and they, and, and they tell the students, don't open your letter until you get on stage at this day. So for everyone who knows they're going to get accepted to college, they get on stage in front of now it's talking about 5,000 people and they announce the, the college that they're going to. And it's this spectacle. And um, there's, there's actually a video on YouTube about it. And it's, and it's this amazing day. The interesting thing about this is that it dramatically increased the amount of students that started going to college in this high school. Because people wanted to get involved and wanted to be a part of that experience. Uh, which is just fascinating. And, and, and it's really about like making the day bigger than it could have ever been about boosting sensory appeal. The next one is Raising the Stakes, and again, it's from um, two teachers in America, and they were sitting one day in a bar, and they said, why, why is school not like playing sport? And then you play sport, you train, and then you have a game, which is kind of that natural peak in an experience, and then you train, and then you might lose, and it goes down, you train, and then you have a grand final, and you know, it's either really good or really bad, depending on the outcome. Um, and, and they said, school's kind of just this monotonous training period where you just constantly train and then you have an exam which is arguably a different experience anyway because it's so stressful around that period. So every year they would get people to do this essay which was called the, um, the Trial of Human Nature and they would put an essay question in front of these students and say go home, read Lord of the Flies by William Golding, I'm not sure if any of you have read the book, and they, and they give them the essay question that says uh, did William Golding wrongly depict humanity as being naturally animalistic? Or was he actually depicting humanity as they are? And you can imagine for a 16-year-old student to get a book and to get an essay question, they go home and then six weeks later they have to bring in a response. It's not the most engaging experience. So people just really, really didn't engage with such, with such a, a meta kind of question as, as the young high student. So what they do is now, and this is, this is called the trial of human nature because that the school does, they break the class in half and they say one half of the class you're going to be the prosecutors, the other half you're going to be the defense. And they give them real evidence, with real evidence, and they say to them, you pick people on your team to be the judge, pick people to be the prosecutor, to be the witnesses. They get a real judge to come in a real court and actually judge um, the, the proceedings. They get their parents and their principal to be the jury. And they, they train, so to speak, for months and months before this event. And then they, they get them to put on suits and stand up in a real courtroom and actually have that experience. And the reason that it's such a powerful experience is because none of these students, unless they go on to become lawyers, are ever going to have that again. They're never going to be able to have that experience again. So that what these teachers managed to do was raise an experience up to a once in a lifetime thing that meant that these kids couldn't help but get engaged. And breaking the script. Uh, so this is a great one. Southwest Airlines is one of my favorite companies to use as, uh, as a case study or reference material because their moral is to be, or their, their, their strategy is to be the low-cost airline in the United States. So nothing that they do will cost um, their service fee any money, effectively. But they empower their staff in some really amazing ways. So in their, um, in their meeting rooms and in their kitchens, they have what's called the Hall of Fame. And on the Hall of Fame, they have a number of quotes that staff members have used when, when you get onto the plane. So you can imagine, when you catch a flight, as many of us have, uh, you get onto the plane and it's a really monotonous experience. You kind of like, wait in security and you wait on the line to get on the plane. You get on the plane and then they say, please, please observe these safety instructions. And uh, so at the same time, everyone who opens safety rules or starts watching something on Netflix. Because it's the same thing every time, right? It's like, I know how to put in my seatbelt buckle. I know how to put on my, my life vest. What they do is they allow staff to, to take liberty, if you will. Um, so they say, you know, the smoking area, uh, so they say this is a smoking flight and the smoking area is on the wing and if you can light them, you can smoke them. And one of the other ones is uh, if, 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 the, if the air masks have to drop down and you're traveling with children, please put the air mask on, air mask on first before anyone else. If you're traveling with more than one child, who's the one who's less likely to put you in a home? <laughs> <laughs> and what's interesting is although those kind of wisecracks seem funny, they actually did a bit of analysis. And what was interesting is that the, the clients who were on those flights flew more. 
sufficient to rope up the experience, to rope up the monotony of everyday life. It was something that was different, it was something that they didn't expect. And many of you would have taken a train today, I imagine, or some of you have taken a Sydney train before. Um, this is one of my experiences. I'm not sure if you've ever been on a train in Sydney and you've heard something on the lines of like, Good morning everyone, welcome to Central, we're now stopping the town hall, winning in, all those, you know. So that's not by chance, that's not one person kind of who really enjoys speaking like that. Sydney Trains had a decision and they decided to not automate train announcements but rather to send every train conductor on a radio broadcasting course, which is really interesting. And the reason they did that is because when they did customer research, they found that one, having a train conductor doing announcements made people feel safer. Uh, it also pr provided a kind of nostalgic thing for some people, but at the end of the day, it's also cheaper for them to have the person who's on the train doing that anyway. So they send people who might not be very comfortable speaking English as a first language to these courses so that they feel comfortable, but it has a really amazing experience. And one day I was on the train and a conductor did exactly that. And the person next to me got off, went up to the conductor and shook his hand and said, you've just made my week. And I was, I was shocked. I was like, in what world would a person ever shake a conductor's hand and tell them that they just made their week? And it's purely because Sydney trains empower their staff to raise, an, to raise an experience from something that was going to be average to something that was really amazing. Now, moments of insight. Moments of insight are defining moments that rewire our understanding of ourselves or the world. And in a few seconds or moments, uh, we realize something that might influence our lives for decades. Um, now, this story is, is from Microsoft Azure, which is um, a, a platform or an application that allows people to, to build applications. And uh, what's, what's kind of amazing about this story is, is I, I think it's really relatable for me, and I, I, I mean, I hope it kind of touches, touches something for you guys as well, which is one day there was a product manager for Microsoft Azure, and it was in the very, very early days of the application. And they knew they wanted something really amazing because all the feedback that they were getting was saying this tool is fantastic, it's exactly what we wanted to do, but the UI is really bad. I actually, it takes me way too long to have skills, it takes me way too long to learn. So the product manager went to his exec team and said, hey, can I get some funding to go and, 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 and do some development and do some design on the front end of the interface? And they kept on saying no because they never really understood the importance of it. So the product manager got approval to run a two-day workshop where he got the solution architects, the developers, the execs, everyone involved in this product together. And on the first day, he asked them to just come up with an idea, come up with any idea that they were, that they were going to build on the application the next day. And the next day, they came in and they tried to build their, their idea or bring it to life through this application, and none of them could do it. And the, and the execs turned around and he kind of, did, well, they describe it as this, mm, this moment that they call the crystallization of discontent. Um, which is quite interesting. But people are sitting in a room and they're, they, they finally get to the point when they can't do something and they say, wow, we have to change this. We can't do it any other way. And it's a really nice cultural piece to say, how can we bring people together um, to make them face uncomfortable truths? And sometimes it's by like getting people to do the actions themselves to actually um, do something. We, we do something at the top of the company called Service Safaris, uh, where we've done quite a bit of work with Sydney trains. And what we do is we take execs out. So when we take them out of the trains, we give one of them a double crown. We blindfold one of them. We give another one a walk up. And we say, can you go and pick up something in Parramatta and come back to us? And we send them off on the safari, and then they have to experience what it's like to be in the shoes of somebody who's pushing a double crown around all day, or in your wheelchair all day. And once you do that, people have that moment, it crystallizes their discontent, and they say, we have to do something about this. This is an example of some work we did in the space, picking up on what Sean was talking about. And this was specifically with, um, with Oz Harvest. I'm sure that you all heard of Oz Harvest and the great work that they do. Um, the really interesting thing about this as a piece of work was we were asked to, to help us have us understand what were some of the drivers um, around consumer food waste, what were some of the behaviours and some of the influences and the biases that we have as consumers um, around wasting food, um, so that we could help understand that, but also what were the points of influence that we could also help understand as well, because to that exact same point, 
um, how you um, make your decision in the moment, particularly if it's something like food wasting, um, there's a whole complexity that sits around the whole ecosystem of, of biases, of influences, of behaviour and needs that sit around that decision. Um, people in this space, um, it's a very, very um, nuanced space, and particularly for us artists, they want to go out and be able to help spread a message in, in, into that complex space and try and help get a message out there. So this was a piece of work that we did to help, um, to help define that and to help understand who are, um, what are the types of factors that people are thinking about when they're going through their food buying journey uh, and how they manage food in their house, but also where are they getting their sources of influence from. So where are the messages um, that, that stick with people? Um, and where are they looking to try and get those sources of information as well? So it's a particularly curly challenge, but it was one that we did locally here to help um, bring some colour to that and help guide some of the activities that, that us others do on that side of their business, which is about influencing community attitudes to food waste. So at that point, um, how can we speak more people? to come to these realisations on their own. Um, we use that as, a, as a, a particular metaphor for that piece of work that we did because it is so complex, it is so nuanced that we want to try and help influence behaviour and influence um, people's perceptions. And often when we're talking about this space, particularly the more complex areas, what we find is that it's often not a, a technical problem. It tends to not be the solution to these problems, tends to not be the need to go and build a new computer system or to go and build an app. Um, it tends to be one of of behaviour and therefore one of culture. And so because of that it becomes quite nuanced and that's something that we spend quite a bit of time uh, helping to define. The second of these areas is around the moment of pride. So Sean talked a minute ago about a couple of different examples and for this one the moment of pride really is about defining these moments that, that capture us at our best. Um, so there are certain moments and certain peaks across an experience where um, there is a real moment of achievement and there's a real moment of courage that starts to come out. And these are the points, again, that we want to, in understanding them, try and help amplify. How do you help raise that and actually make the most of that point in the experience? One of the great examples I love to point to is the Australian Red Cross. Here locally, I don't know how many people here donate blood or they donate plasma and platelets. I'm a regular donor. Um, and one of the things that I think the Red Cross do an amazing job on is actually humanising that whole experience. Um, you know, on paper, donating blood is um, not overly glamorous. You've got a commit a number of hours to your time. It's a very um, you know, uncomfortable experience to have to go through. A lot of the team make it you know, as amazing and streamlined as they can. But where I think the Australia Red Cross in particular does an amazing job is, is in humanising the experience and actually reflecting to me as a donor what the causation of that donation is. So in this particular case, you know, we've got a particular story of um, individual patients that are told and they're actually expressed. And I know certainly after my last donation, I got an email um, a couple of days after I visited the donation centre saying thank you for helping to save three people's lives. You know, in humanising that donation, what they've actually done is completely recognise that achievement and, and reinforce to me the thing that I've done as an act. Um, now how likely do you think on the back of that I am to go and book my next appointment? Um, very, very highly. In fact, I do it quite religiously on the back of that. That's actually the prompt for me to then go and book my next donation. Um, but I think the Red Cross do an amazing job of actually helping to humanise that story and actually bringing the importance and the relevancy of the thing that you've just achieved to bear. And so despite, you know, the inconvenience and discomfort or whatever, you're actually so much more likely to go back and continue to, to follow this process um, through following that narrative. In moments of connection, so again, through that customer journey, there are a number of moments um, that, are, that are social. You know, there are weddings, there are graduations, there are um, uh, points throughout the journey that really matter at the po point of connection. And again, through mapping out that journey and understanding those peaks and troughs and where are those moments of connections, it gives you the opportunity to actually enable that. Um, and again, either limiting a gap or enhancing something that happens to be a peak point in that journey. So the reference point that I'll point to here is a piece of work we did um, a little while ago with SDN Children's Services. So um, for anyone who knows SDN, they provide childcare services um, here in uh, Sydney, live in New South Wales. So we did a, a piece of work with SDN to help um, just go through the process of that journey, which was um, looking at how different staff members actually participate or different actors participate in a particular experience. 
And so in the case of the childcare service, um, understanding that there can be multiple actors in that space. There's the staff member of the service, there's the parent who's coming to pick up the child, and there's also the child themselves. So you've actually got three distinctly unique actors in that experience. And the fact that you're going through and mapping out that journey from a parent's perspective, there's a whole range of different um, anxieties, I'm sure, for anyone in the room who's got small children or had small children and had to do that run to go and pick up the kids from daycare at the end of the day. Um, working back from picking up a child from childcare services, there's a whole bunch of, of stresses and anxieties and events that, that all back up to that point. So as a parent, I might be at work at four o'clock, I've got to know that I've got to leave in enough time to be able to pick up my child and get to the childcare centre through traffic, which in Sydney is always variable, could be 20 minutes one day or an hour and a half the next. I'm leaving ahead of time, I'm leaving probably at 4 o'clock or 4.30 in an office, and depending upon the office culture that might be something that's frowned upon, it might be something that people are looking saying, oh there's Chris leaving early again. I'm getting in the car to try and get there, I've got to battle through traffic, of course my boss comes to ask me as six questions that he's been meaning to get me about all day at the moment before I head out of the office as well, and that's inevitably the time that he comes up to ask me that. So again, I'm sort of looking at the clock trying to get out the door. I get into traffic, it ends up being a, a better or a worse run than what I'd expected. I get to the childcare centre and I get to pick up my child who inevitably doesn't want to be going home because they've been having a good day in childcare. Plus they're at the end of their tether because they've been there all day and they're ready to go home. You pick up a child, you get back into the car, then you've got dinner and bath time to look forward to. Fantastic. But even understanding that journey and the precursors and the setup of what influences that, suddenly that opens up a whole bunch of opportunities around. So how do we help manage that? How do we help mitigate some of those points? Are there opportunities in there as a business and as an organisation? Or are there points that we just can't address? So how can we again work with the gaps? Are there things that we can do and processes that we can do that actually acknowledge that something's outside of our control, but we can still make it better in a number of different ways? So again, there's a, a range of different things that are uh, options in understanding what that journey looks like and thinking about it through the different actors that participate in that. <laughs> again, not only is that within one particular journey for one particular actor in this experience, but it also opens up a whole bunch of experiences about what are the relationships between those those experiences as well. Are there natural troughs, natural peaks that are occurring that also happen to coincide for different groups? So does a, a peak pain point for a staff member also happen to be a peak pain point for my customer? Well that's really interesting. And that's a point at which maybe there's a double win. As an organisation, can I do something in that that gives an outcome that's great for the, the customer or the participant, but also a great outcome for our staff member as well? So what is more important in creating and fostering a connection? I'll hand back to you, Sean, this one. Um, I'm, I'm at your hands again. So that's <laughs> um, so, so, so first, put up your hand if you think purpose is more important. Yeah. And then put up your hand if you think passion is more important. Put up your hand if you think purpose. <laughs> um, so that what's, what, what's quite interesting is that, um, a bit more big purpose, <laughs> but it's, it's interesting because my passion is not your passion, and we might have the same purpose, we might all be trying to do the same thing. I think that the, the really amazing thing about this slide is that most people in this room are purpose-driven organizations. They are actually trying to do something, and they're trying to do something um, because they believe in it. Um, but being passionate about something doesn't necessarily mean that the person next to you is going to be passionate about it. And although you may share a passion with somebody, you might believe in the same purpose as somebody else who is passionate about a completely different thing. And creating purpose within organizations is really, really, really important. And you see it more and more these days. Uh, there's a report that Chris and I were discussing earlier, which is about the millennial mindset. It's about what do the millennials care about? And the most important thing, the number one thing that millennials care about is purpose. Companies like Patagonia, companies like Tom Shoes, for example, that's what people really care about. You know, Patagonia donating $10 million that they got from the US government as a tax break straight to global research, um, to, to global warming research was amazing. It shows them, it shows the world that they care about something. And if we look, especially looking at a younger demographic, that's what they care about. They care about companies who care about something. And I would imagine almost all the companies in India care about something. So how do you raise that to the fore and how do you get people to understand your purpose? 
uh, both outside your organization but also inside your organization because getting people to work together is really important. Um, so creating connection, this is a story from a health services provider in the United States. And they had a, um, an all-hands meeting one year where they said, you know what, we really want to change the way that our organization provides services. And they wanted to become customer-focused, they wanted to become patient-focused, I suppose you would call it. And they said, well, one of the things that we want to do, and this came from a, a, a bunch of research that they've done, is they wanted to combat patient loneliness. So they stood up on stage and they said to everyone, well, how can you find it within your day-to-day -day task to, com to combat patient loneliness? The next year, and they, 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 they implemented a custom measurement system, the, the next year they, they honed in on one hospital in one, in, in one wing, um, and they ended up finding a janitor who was causing some really, really amazing um, customer sentiment results. He was, he was having a huge impact, and specifically around combating patient loneliness. So one of the questions they had was, you know, how connected would you feel with the people with the hospital? And there was a huge spike when this janitor was working. And they went in and they said to him, kind of, why do you do what you do? And he goes, because my boss told me to do it. And they go, but why does that matter? And he goes, oh, because, because it keeps the room clean. But why does keeping the room clean matter? And he goes, because it keeps the patients happy and healthy. And, that's, and, and isn't that what we're here to do? And by providing kind of that North Star for somebody to focus on, you had a custodian, you know, somebody who could have just gone into work every day and cleaned a room like anyone else, engaging with, with patients. He went in there every day and he noticed that there was elderly people who were lonely. So what did he do is while he cleaned, he spoke and he just talked to them. And it had amazing impacts on their customer experience. And it's a really powerful story about how setting a really clear purpose can filter down to anyone within your organization. And empowering them to make change, to be able to do something on that, is really important. Empowering staff members to make change is probably one of the most important things that you can do. To feel as though it's within their remit to, to improve the customer's experience, and that they're not just following the process. So I, I, I really love this quote. And it's a moment of shared meaning instills not the pride of individual accomplishment, but the profound sense of connection that comes, comes from subordinating oneself to a great mission. And I'm sure many of you have volunteers who are working with you. And the reason that they get involved in the things that they are involved within um, and helping provide the services that they're providing is because they want to feel as though they're part of something bigger. They know that one person can't make a difference, but together they can. And it's that feeling of getting involved and having a common purpose and sharing that purpose with, with other people that can have a huge impact um, on how your staff behaves on a day-to-day -day basis. So using this in your day to day, like hand back over to Christian. Yeah, thank you. So how can we use this? Some of the points that we've talked about today in your day to day. So first of all, the moments of elevation, um, they lift us out of the everyday. So can you think through the journeys that you've got? And if you haven't done um, some experience mapping or some journey mapping work, it's, it's a very, very valuable experience across an organisation because the relevance, the relevancy of it can apply to everybody within an organisation, doesn't matter whether you're on the front line or you're in the IT systems group or you're in HR, um, the one commonality that you have is the customer in the thing that we're doing. So what are those moments of elevation? If you know what they are, how can we use them? How can we amplify them? How can we use them to lift us out of there every day? We've talked about some different ways of doing that. What are the moments of insight that spark discoveries about our world and ourselves? So going through that process, are there, are there points that we didn't know before? Are there natural gaps and natural holes in the experience that were completely unknown to us as an organisation that now that we know that they're there, we can do something about actively? Um, what are the moments of pride that capture us doing what we're doing the best? And again, how can we make the most of that? So can we uh, amplify that? Can we tell that story? Can we reinforce it? Can we share it? Can we spread it? So what are the ways that we can do that? And the moments of connection. So where are those moments of connection? Um, what are those natural points where staff member and participants or staff members and customers naturally come together? And how can we make the very best of that experience? And again, whether that be through our people, or our processes, or our capabilities, how can we do things better to try and make that critical touch point as good as it possibly can be? So again, we see those four there's four pieces being the pieces of a jigsaw that fit together. 
Um, and again, we can dial up and dial down those depending upon where that moment sits in a, in a journey, the relevancy of them, but they give us tools in a toolkit that we can actually use day to day to actually make an instant change to the experiences that customers have with our organisation. Remember to try and think about these peaks and these pits. As a, as a consumer um, and as a human being, we are always constantly looking for those peak points, those pit points and the end points. The other bits that define what our gut feel is about a history, about a brand, about an organisation, about interaction. So in understanding those and thinking those things, how can we make the most of those? How can we mitigate the pits and amplify the peaks? One last piece of work that I was to make reference to was a piece of work we did um, recently for Unison, um, who was a, a, a provider in the NBIA space. Um, and it was particularly interesting in this place because again, we talk about um, complex ecosystems and the NDIS is certainly a complex ecosystem. Um, I'm sure a number of people in this room today who um, work in this space and so um, certainly not telling you anything, but this was a really interesting piece of work for us to get immersed into that space. And we worked um, with Unison to understand what that space was and the complexity within it, but also what was their role in delivering service um, to participants and the families um, that, that were uh, working with, in, uh, with Unison on behalf of their, their family members. And one of the things that we did there was by really understanding what that journey was and what those touch points were with Unison as an organisation was again understanding where those peaks and those troughs were and saying where can we actually um, address specific areas of commonality for the participant and for the organisation and really build a program of work around improving those. Um, and uh, very happy to say that we've had an ongoing conversation with Unison about what that looks like, how do we bring that to life and what are the types of actions that that we can do to make the participants' journey through that experience um, you know, much better than what it is today. And I'll just quickly talk about Charity Water. So Charity Water is uh, an organisation, or a, a, a for-purpose organisation from the United States, uh, and their goal is to try to provide clean drinking water to everyone in the world. And they've had amazing success with, uh, with the work that they've done. They've reached millions and millions of people, um, primarily focusing on Africa. But what's quite interesting is that um, I came across them because I, I, I encountered them while reading a blog about good UX design, about good digital interface design. And what I found was that Charity Water had spent a huge amount of time investing no, into their experience, that. into their online experience, because they rely on donations to, to provide their services. Uh, and what they found through customer research was that there was a couple of things that really mattered to customers. And one of the most important things was trust. Trust that the money that the, that the person was donating was going to go to the person who was going to be drinking that water at the end of the day. Uh, so it became kind of their number one concern is how do we provide the most amount of trust? How do we, through our digital experience, make people feel confident that all the money that they're providing is going to these people? Um, and within that, they also provide a connection. They have stories. Uh, they have kind of a bold brand, a bold interface. Uh, their, their website, if you go onto it later, specifically calls out experiences of people who didn't have water before and now have water afterwards. Uh, and and what's, what's quite amazing is, yeah, if, if you go onto the site, you can see if you want to donate money to a specific community, it has a, it has a the Google Maps plugin on there, and it, you can satellite in right into the community and see exactly where it's going to. And the way that they do this is they're very transparent about where the money goes. So they have a thing called the well and the spring. And the well is a group of kind of high value donators who support all their operational costs. And then the spring is anyone like you or me who wants to, who wants to donate, donate money can donate to the spring. And I know that 100% of that money is going towards helping provide clean drinking water to people. And that's purely through their digital interface. Uh, so they would be a really good company, I suppose, if anyone wanted to go on and have a look online to see how you could rethink a digital interaction to engage people better and to, and to drive throughput, which is drive donations. Uh, because even from testing things, I mean, I'm not sure if you can see from there, but donations are, go up in these kind of strange increments from $29, $38 a month. And the, the way that they did that, they do something called A-B testing. And they put up just different prices every day until they find, find prices that people are more likely to donate towards. So it's completely data driven. They just keep putting up different prices and seeing what the, what the highest rate of donation is, which is quite amazing. And they've taken a completely digital approach to doing that. 
Um, and this is, one of, this is one of my ones, actually, that I've never seen done, but I really want to see done. So if anyone can do it, please, please do it. Um, imagine if one day someone donated money, or I donated money, to Charity Water, and then instead of the normal transaction receipt that I get from someone like Uber, which is V23744303 slash 03 Uber, hashtag trip, like that means nothing to me, right? I go through my credit card bill, that means absolutely nothing to me. Imagine if one day you went on and said, glad to be of service, Uber, or I hope you got at home, okay, Uber, or thank you for your donation, Red Cross, or you know, we've got you covered, NIB. Well, why don't companies do that? It's a, really, it's a really easy channel of marketing, but it also shows that you care. And to bring it back to the point, it breaks the script. It, it's something that nobody is thinking about, but it's just one of those little moments. It's like, it's, it's what we call in, in, in software design, it's called Easter eggs. But these little things that you place into the experiences that don't really need to be there. But they're there, and that when you find them, you have this like, strange affinity to the thing that you're using because you found something that no one else has. And when you do that, you create a relationship with customers that, that creates that, that level of connection. So in essence, this isn't about green fields, blue sky, or thinking so far outside the box, and you forgot that there even is a box. Um, and what this book or what this presentation will hopefully do is give you the tools that you need to create memorable experiences without having to break the status quo. Uh, and too often I go into uh, companies or I speak to people and they're like, oh yeah, we're doing whiteboard exercising, we're coming up and we're kind of flip the whole thing in its head. And then the ideas are just completely impractical, no one can implement them. And what I really love about this book is it gives you tangible examples of where companies have just taken one little moment and made it that much better. They've just done something. Um, so I think ask yourself if you wanted to uh, take on board any of these things, what opportunities does your experience naturally afford? And that might come through just speaking to your staff members from knowing yourself the experiences of what your customers are going through. It might also come through NPS feedback. It might, it might, it might come through actually analyzing where the experiences have natural peaks and, peaks and natural troughs. Uh, question, you know, what principles could be applied? They say in the book, just pick one. Pick elevation, for example, or pride. We, we picked pride once when we were working at a life insurer, when um, um, fi financial advisors want to, be the, want to be the people to give the check to the individual. We said, well, how can we elevate that? How can we make pride something um, with, with, within that experience? And we found that a physical check was something that they really valued, and we found out through qualitative research. So what did we do? We were designing everything digitally. The only non-digital experience that we designed was a check. And it wasn't a bank check that you actually have to go to the bank and check. It was a bank check, but it had a little QR code scanner or something on it. And then when somebody went out to their client, they could hand them the check, still be in charge of that experience, feel really proud of getting the money for their client in a time of need. And then they could take out their phone and they could engage it in a digital medium. And they could and then they can transact that payment instantaneously by just scanning that code. Um, and then how can you create a peak moment? So how can you create an amazing experience, just one amazing experience, and just pick one moment and say, well, what can we do there? The target one specific moment and raise it from good to great. Thank you. Thank you. 
So it's interesting, isn't it? So how have you, in terms of the customer experience, how have you looked at segmenting five gems and gone maybe just do this rather than trying to cover the section? I'll go for a start of a tab and you can join in after. Can you please see that question? Sorry, praise your question. Um, in a world that is as um, um, distributed in segments as it is today, we've got five different generations now all in the workforce at once. How do you design products and services knowing that you've got such a spread of demography out there? How do you actually try and deliver things that are tangible to, to everybody? Um, I think hopefully I've captured it in the right way. Um, yeah, so my view on that would be that, that um, human-centered design is, is no more important than it is now um, because of that exact same reason. So gone are the days of, of standardized products. We, we just don't have them anymore. Um, and the ones that we do have won't be around for much longer. <laughs> um, the fact is, is that, that that diversity is something that we're all having to work with. Um, and in fact, human-centered design gives you an opportunity to actually um, understand, primarily, show empathy for the segments that we're not in, um, to understand what are the, the, the views, the needs, the behaviors of a segment, such as a millennial segment, which I'm not a member of. Um, but by going and doing a lot of research and understanding who those customers are, we actually understand what are the values that they have, and then what are the commonalities that exist between those different, those different segments, those different generations. Um, there are commonalities that sit across them, um, and there are things of a market difference too. And so understanding that is the first step. Um, and then secondarily, it's then about, so how do I deliver an experience that they're a product that's the most appropriate for those types of, uh, of participants, knowing full well there's a bell curve. And I'm probably not gonna be able to deliver something that's universal for everybody in that. So that's okay, recognizing that's one thing, but what I might do as an organization is choose to deliver a service or a product that actually caters for a particular segment more than something else. Um, and that, again, that insight and knowing that that's the case is actually the key to all of that. How, how you actually execute the marketing and the presentation of an existing product or create a new product or a, a new service that actually targets a specific segment. Yeah. Um, so from, a, from a service execution point of view, um, segments is one way of looking at customers, but we'd like to talk about personas as well. So you might be a person in a specific segment or a specific gen, but you actually have the exact same needs, behaviours and attitudes towards how you behave as somebody who is a millennial, for example. Um, and I'll give you an example, we did some work with um, the State Insurance Regulatory Authority on the CTP reform that recently came out. So I'm not sure if any of you know that you can claim and you can get money back on your CTP as of last year. Um, that was part of the transformation work that we did because they released new legislation. And we found that there were four different types of customers, regardless of their segments or their generation or their age or anything like that. It was more, you know, how proactive were they and how accountable were they? And once we started to look at people's behaviours, then we stopped looking at segments and those sorts of things. And we started to say, well, how can we design services uh, that cater for the needs of different types of individuals, regardless of, of age or generation or something like that? Uh, and that, that's been a really powerful tool because, um, yeah, then we can equip people like call centre managers to be able to say, this is probably a type of person that's calling a call centre. Because the type of person who's going to first go through a digital channel is very different from the type of person who's going to go through a call centre initially. And then creating that channel management strategy to how do you escalate through from digital, through the phone, through the email, and then human is really important in understanding where the different types of customers are going to more, most likely engage. I mean, most people are going to have that difficulty in terms of donors. And we have clients, you have the donors, and you'll have four generations.
the variations in it, but the end is probably the thing that people should focus on the most. So just following up on the question my colleague in the middle, how do you sort of balance between what customer wants and what you do for the I'll start in Yeah, how do you balance what, what customers want versus what, what the organization can deliver or what's valuable to, to the organization? Um, we have um, a, a fairly um, robust approach to doing that type of model where we we consider three different factors. One, one is desirability, one is feasibility, and one is viability. So desirability is, is as the, the name on the tin suggests, how desirable is a particular thing, a service, a product, a capability from a customer perspective alone? Um, how, does, how feasible is it for the organisation to actually deliver that capability? Um, and how desirable is it for the business to actually be able to deliver that? What, what's the benefit to the organisation, either in reducing costs or driving revenues or, or um, increasing the efficiency of the organisation. And um, it's really about finding the balance between those three factors. Because again, you can come up with your highly desirable feature from a customer perspective, but if it's going to cost you $10 million and be you know, um, uh, incapable for the organisation to support one the term, a hmm, bit of a challenging problem. Then equally, the things, um, the truth shouldn't equally be just about the things that, are, that necessarily generate business improvement as well. Because if there isn't a lens of, of desirability from a customer perspective, um, building it and they will come isn't, isn't a very great strategy. So it's about finding that sweet spot between those three different aspects. Yeah. And I would say it's, our, our approach is it's a very transparent approach. So I'd say human centered design in the way that things are done is traditionally quite different to how, how projects are managed. Otherwise, you know, when you would have seen photos of post it notes and journey maps and people standing around whiteboards and those sorts of things. Um, it, it, it looks nice and it kind of looks cool or whatever, but it actually has a dual benefit. When people in, in the offices walk past us, they start to get engaged and people start to share knowledge. And then by doing that, they start to take on, you know, what does the customer want and how can I put, put that into my day to day? But also what concessions can I make? Because once I hear a story about, you know, a customer who had to drive 30 kilometers to go do a certain checkup for a life insurance policy or something like that, it changes the way that you perceive that process and it kind of crystallizes people into wanting to do something about it as well. Just to that, that point as well, that verbatim and, and that voice of the customer is incredibly important too because it's incredibly powerful. It's, it's a really powerful way of, you know, we talked about humanizing the experience, but it really brings that voice to bear. Um, you know, I, I had a quote from a participant um, a number of years ago now um, where we were interviewing them about signing up um, for a new product. And that customer gave a quote that sticks with me today where, where the customer said to me, um, I've been a customer of yours for 28 years um, and um, I've got six different accounts with you and yet every time I speak to you, you make me feel like it's the first time that we've ever met. Now, that was, that was a quote that I put on a PowerPoint slide and showed to the executive of that particular organisation and that was pretty much all I had to say. Um, so that's, there's something like in the power of what people say in going through that research method that actually helps really bring those stories to life and actually really humanises it as well. Things. It's always going to be a different flow, 
Um, I wouldn't say there's necessarily a, a, a rule whether or not it should be one up, one down, or anything like that. It, it's really contextual on the experience that you have and the type of person that's engaging with it. Um, and just trying to make sure that there is a natural flow and accepting that things aren't going to be great all the time. So often I see companies want to kind of just do that and just lift everything up, right? But actually sometimes it's really important to have kind of a lull in an experience because the service that you're providing isn't always the most important thing in that person's life, you know? Oftentimes it's actually of a secondary importance uh, or third or fourth or fifth. And understanding when to kind of walk away and then when to bring yourself back into that person's life is really important. So letting that natural flow occur is, is great. Yeah. And then the other piece I'd, I'd add to that is um, just to add a little bit of complexity to it is not only are uh, customers coming through those journeys and potentially multiple journeys like we showed there for one particular organisation, but they're doing it for every brand and every type of service that they interact with. And so those comparison points are against all of those, not just one of those. So even though we might look at the customer's interaction with our brand as being singular because we work an organisation and we care about that. Um, from a consumer perspective, of course, they're touching a whole range of different organisations. And so what you find as well is that expectation bar increases. So, um, you know, 10 years ago, nobody was looking at booking cabs via Uber, and now everybody's looking at, how, well, how come I can't track my package? How come I can't see where something's up to? You can thank eBay, Amazon, Uber, and Star Trek for, for giving that rise of expectation. And suddenly now I'm looking at brands saying, well, why, why can't I see in real time what my package is up to? This is outrageous. So that whole waterline of experience and expectation shifts over time as well. So that's the other thing to look at. The expectation bar that people had a decade ago isn't what the expectation is today, nor will it be in five years' time. So what do you anchor yourself around? And that's where, again, having a human centered design approach is really, really important. Because that allows you to baseline that. So what happens if you the ceiling? The ceiling moves, unfortunately. <laughs> it's a moving ceiling. So I'd just like to say thank you to and to Chris for taking the time to come and share those experiences and moments with us um, because it is a busy journey that we're all competitive in and taking those moments and understanding what are the pits uh, in our organisation and I know at CBA and HLB we measure around the promoter score and it's a very big key focus for us around understanding our clients' journeys and how can we make that better and we know in the uh, for impact space that it is very competitive and it's only going to get more competitive for your donors and for those that you support and who are going to seek your services with uh, artificial intelligence impacting on jobs and how is that going to increase homelessness and things like that. So we really wanted to share how can you know these types of thoughts uh, come back to your organisation and if you just pick one thing out of what they said today um, one moment that you can work on and how that can make your organisation from better to great. I mean, that, that's a great initiative that you can do. Um, so thank you again for coming along today. Um, so I might invite Daryl Sandellis to come up. He's going to talk about um, impact measurement and um, we're all trying to measure what we're doing and making sure we're getting the, the most out of what we do. So this is not a big talk, it's just a, just a couple of little things to know. Um, I saw a, uh, an article in Pro Bono magazine recently telling everybody that if you want to get a lot more money for your organisation and make impact investing, this is where you've got to target. You've got to target the people with the money and, and so they would invest in your organisation so you can make an impact. Um, now that's, that's where things are going. We, we work closely with our people in the US. You'll find that they, they've been on that journey probably five years ahead of where Australia is with that now. Um, so it will happen here. But one of the things I noticed in that was if people are going to invest in your impact, you have to tell them what it is. We talked to you before about that, that actually being we can help you measure that impact. Um, not only to help you get better donors, but so that your janitors are saying, I'm here to make people healthier. Um, because they understand that everything you do has an impact. And if you use that as a basis for organisation and everything you do, you'll get these outcomes that we're looking at here. So just 
have a look at that um, article about uh, fundraising for impact investing and also think about the starting point which is measuring where your impact is today and where you can go with that. Um, you also will have also received a communication from HLB yesterday or last Friday about uh, our income recognition template. We're, we're extremely proud of this little tool because it's an accounting thing that you've all got to go through and it's got lots of change and lots of complexity and lots of judgments in it. So we've got your little um, flowchart that says, all right, if you answer a couple of questions, it will tell you where to go next to end up with the right answer. Um, uh, we've sent that to all of our HLB clients, to our non-HLB clients. We've told you about it and we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to come out and help you find your way through this horrible, horrible new set of rules that we've got to comply with <coughs> because we, we figured out a nice easy way to do it. So hopefully that's helpful. So please speak with any of the actual people here if you uh, are interested in uh, taking advantage of that. Um, sorry. Yeah, um, we've got a couple of minutes before we, we, we shut the thing down. Um, we often have a bit of an open forum at the end of here, but we haven't got time for a full one of those. But I just wanted to put out there, is someone come along with something today that they wanted to to talk to someone about or get an answer on or just discuss an issue with someone else in the room that you haven't had a chance to do it yet. Um, we've got a couple of minutes now for you to throw up that question, comment, thing that you've realised recently that you didn't realise before, something that might help somebody else, a way through the NDIA that we've finally come across. Has anybody got anything that they would like to raise in the last few minutes we've got? Or share. Has someone done something fabulous? Sure, someone has done something fabulous. Andy Kelly, you always do fabulous things. But I mean, it's good to share. I mean, that's, that's the reason for the forum. So, if someone has something fabulous that they want to share with the group? Well, 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 well he's on the block. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've just opened a new school in Dublin. Oh, right. Or um, a really participatory. concepts I have in my team is about the genuine article, which is that people hanker for the genuine article. And I know we're in a digital age, but we'll take a conversation over a text message, we'll take a home-cooked meal over McDonald's. And the interaction that we have with our donors, um, we, we pride ourselves on, on being genuine. I just thought um, we can model and we can examine the data, but we got a bequest a couple of months ago mm -hmm. $200,000 from a lady who'd given us $10 a month uh, up until 2009. And we hadn't heard from her ever since. And everybody's scratching their heads. Says, Where, where's this money come from? Well, if you fill in the very human story, Beryl was giving to us. Then Henry, who'd been happily married to Beryl, passed on. She had to go into care. And all the accounts were shut down. So nothing happened, but the will was in place. And so when we do look at data, we've got to look very carefully at the narrative we want to place over it and the actual very human story that exists underneath it. But right at the very beginning is a, is a genuine interaction with this donor that made her want to contribute to our institute. So thank you very much for talking about Moments That Matter because it's 
those moments that matter that ultimately lead to terrific donations and, and very diverse supporters. So thank you. Okay, so we are a little bit early, which is good. Um, we're now going to do our business card draw. So has everyone put their business card into the... I start this way. <laughs> so you get to take home a beautiful bunch of flowers. So if you're in trouble, your problem solved. Projects uh, definitely engage with them. Um, if you want an introduction, though, or if you want to kind of shift some mindsets with some of your staff, I do have some workshops coming up in August, September, October, probably next February, March. The list goes on. <laughs> so basically, um, come and let me know. They're one-day workshops, and you can bring a team of up to four people. It is a great way um, to immerse yourself in some of those methods. So um, design thinking is one of them. I'm also launching. Um, this next financial year, I'll be launching uh, donor journey mapping or customer journey mapping just as a one-day introduction. So if you're interested in any of those, come and, come and see me, grab a business card or, or give me yours, um, and I'll make sure that you're registered for the next event. That's it for me. Thank you, everyone. So that brings us to the conclusion of our ENFP. Um, I just want to just take a moment um, if I get a bit emotional, just, you know, <coughs> allow it to occur. Um, I just want to reflect on two of our ENFP community members who, which have passed within the last 12 months. Susan Nichols, CFO of Wesley Mission, and Ralph Mitchell, COO of CMRI, who most of the people in this room knew. Who most of the people in this room have known for, since our inception of 10 years ago, who knew these people, knew what they stood for, understood their purpose, and they just did so many great things. So I just want to leave you with this. Time is something we can't buy. Time is something that we can't hold on to. So I want us to all look at the person beside us and just say, you know, I want to know you, I want to give you time, I want to give everyone here time, and I want to give us the the allowance to say we can give ourselves time to our family because it's not all about work. So I give you, my friends, some time to do that. Thank you very much. <laughs>